So the next thing I'm going to talk about is how to use some of the things we can conclude from the adaptive landscape theory, how, can, how we can use that to optimize our own success in terms of business or life or whatever. Yeah, this is like self-help stuff. No, I'm not like saying I'm the greatest, you know, most successful person. I Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. You don't know anything about me. But I think if you apply these models, then it, it, there are some things that can be useful. So, first of all, outcomes are really unevenly distributed in human populations. So if we talk about the billionaires, the richest person on Earth who makes $177 billion, which is just insane. If you think of how much $177 million is, that's insane. But it's like the human mind can't even comprehend some numbers they are so large. You have to take a, a thousand times that. Then Elon Musk, it's $161 billion. A billion, you can't even comprehend this. P people who make a big deal about how much money billionaires have they, they understand like that, just how une uneven these numbers are, right? Which I'm not like making a moral judgment on. I'm not saying, oh, income inequality, that's so bad. No, I'm just remarking on it boggles the human mind that the human mind can't even understand how uneven some of these distributions are. In most cases in real life, the relationship between investment and returns, it's a lot like depicted here. It's a nonlinear relationship. Reality is governed by winner-take-all dynamics. Reality is governed by power laws. One thing you've probably heard of is the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 Principle. Now, the actual number is 80-20. They don't actually matter that much. In real life, it may not be 80-20. It may be some different combination of numbers. But the point is that it's governed by power laws. If you think about Jeff Bezos, let's say he makes, I don't know, $40 billion a year. I don't know. I just made that number up. But then his employee... His employee makes $40,000 a year. Now, does that mean that Jeff Bezos was just a million times more productive than his employee, or a million times more skilled, or a million times whatever? Well, we can't conclude that. Because in real life, as I went over, it's not actually a relationship that's linear between skill and results. It's an exponential relationship between investment, or whatever inputs you put in, and what you get out in the end. Not every enterprise will exhibit this relationship between investment and returns, but I would make a bold claim. I think you should actually seek out some activities that do have this distribution because you really want to succeed at something like this. And if you can't succeed at one thing like this, just find something like this where you can succeed and apply your skills there. Because the payouts for being like the top 1% in any one of these fields, any field like this, the fields are so great that it's worth it to seek out those kinds of fields specifically and maximize that. So it makes out to seek out enterprises with exponential compounding returns to investment and specialize in those. You really want to specialize. Like You don't want to pick five different fields and maybe put all your eggs in different baskets because then you'll just be average at all of them. I mean, there are big exceptions to this, and I'll get into that, but if you pick one field and really, really, really become obsessed with it for a period of time, then you have a chance, at least, of becoming one of those top guys. So imagine you have three industries, right, or in each, each industry, the returns are the square of the investment you put in, and you have, you know, 10 points to put in. So if you put, if you split them across three industries, that's you know, three in one, three in one, four in another, the most you're ever going to get is 16. But if you put up 10 in one industry, that's 100, 100 returns because it's an exponential distribution. Well, certainly as, a, as an entrepreneur or founder of a company, uh, you, the, the goal is always to aim for a monopoly. It is to, uh, to do something no one else is doing. You'd much rather have started a company like Google than to have started uh, the pizza place in downtown Palo Alto, or or even or even like a say an airline company, which is a big company, but has an, the airline industry in the U.S. has made no profits in a hundred years cumulatively because the competition has destroyed all of them. So, all right. So uh, you argue, in fact, in it's a how-to book. You're trying to provide concise, memorable lessons, but there's one that particularly struck me, and I wondered whether you're saying this to be memorable or whether you really mean it. You argue that there are really only two kinds of businesses, monopolies 
and those that never make any money. I, really? I, um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, pretty much everything I, I say in this book. It's, it is, uh, it's, it's. Those are the two fundamental forms of business. The difference gets obscured tremendously. Most business books tell you uh, how you should compete more effectively, and mine uh, goes somewhat against that grain and tells you that you should not compete. The general theme I would suggest is that all trends um, are overrated. And so uh, if you think about current uh, trends in technology, healthcare IT software, education software, overrated. SaaS enterprise software, really overrated. Um, big data, cloud computing. These buzzwords are sort of like a tell in poker that people are bluffing and that there's nothing, that there's uh, that the business is not undifferentiated because the buzzwords tell you that it is one company of a category that's undifferentiated from the others in that category and therefore uh, are symptomatic somehow of, of um, a lot of competition and a bad, uh, a bad business idea. You know, science starts with the number two, with things that are sort of experimentally repeatable, but, um, but great businesses is are zero to one. It's, it's, they're always one of a kind. And, and I think this is the conventional wisdom is always that capitalism and competition are somehow synonyms. I believe they're antonyms. A capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. And so I, I, you know, I think there's this, uh, this very strange phenomenon in uh, Silicon Valley where, uh, where a lot of the most uh, talented uh, uh, start, startups, a lot of the great startups, seem to be run by people who are suffering from a mild form of Asperger's. And I think, I think we need to always turn this fact around and uh, view this as an indictment of our whole society. Because what does it say about our society when anyone who does not suffer from Asperger's, who is socially well adapted, will be talked out of all of their original creative ideas before they're even fully formed, who will sense this is a little bit too weird, that's a little bit strange, that sounds a little bit crazy, people are looking at me in a weird way. Um, Here are two graphs that represent monopoly and perfect competition, which is a concept within economics, within microeconomics, within theory of the firm. So I think that these graphs are really important in order to understand economics as it conceptualizes industries and a lot of people just don't understand the concepts in these graphs when they really should. I, th I think um, if you're a socialist, well, 99% of them don't understand the concepts in these graphs, but if you do, as a socialist, you know more than almost any other socialist, so you should at least, if you want to understand economics as it's taught in universities, you have to understand these because it's extremely important, right? So perfect competition. You see P equals MR equals AR. That means the price at which goods are sold. So if you're a seller under perfect competition, it's impossible for you to sell for a price higher than that. And also there's no reason whatsoever to sell for a price lower than that. Because if you sell for a price lower than that, well, you'll sell the good anyway if you price it at the market price. So if you price it lower, you might sell the good sooner but you won't sell more because you're going to sell everything that you produce anyway. So you might as well price it at the maximum price you can, which is the market price. But if you price higher than that, this is a theoretical, it's not, it's perfect, which means it doesn't exist in reality, but you can't actually price higher than that because this is, this is a, a market where there are infinity sellers and infinity buyers. Well, not, there doesn't actually need to be infinity, but just, it's just a theoretical. It's a, there's enough buyers and sellers that, there's no true differentiation. And all the pro products are homogenous. All the products are the same, right? MC means the marginal cost and AC means the average cost. And so you have output on the X axis and cost and revenue on the Y axis. So under perfect competition, there is technically no profit, which is not actually a problem. Because the way people think about profit is different than how economists think about profit. Accounting profit is different than economics profit. So let's say you have an industry, or let's say you have a company that has zero profit. That's not actually necessarily a problem. I mean, it's a problem as in the firm would like to make profit. But 
it's not a problem as in the functioning of the firm, which is to say that if you have zero profit, you can still pay all your workers. And if the CEO, if the CEO is an employee, you can still pay the CEO also because the CEO is in, in their capacity as an employee. You're paying them. So it's not really a problem because all, the, all those wages, all those, everything that you would pay all of your employees and everything you pay for raw materials and everything you pay for rent and all that stuff, that is a cost. Those are costs, right? And so if, if you have zero profits, then you can still pay all your employees and, and cover all your costs. And you just don't, to, to say you have zero profit, it's just a, a kind of mathematical thing. It means you don't make any profit in addition to what those things you need to cover. And you, you think, how, how can a company operate if it doesn't have any profit? Well, easily, right? And it, how can it how can it expand if it doesn't have any profit? Well, easy. If you if you reinvest your profits, quote unquote, into your company, then they no longer are profits because you reinvest them into buying new things, paying more employees, hiring more employees, buying more more apartments and and uh, office space and all that stuff. All of those things which you buy to expand your business, those are costs also. And so zero profit, it, it, it's, there's a difference between profit and wages. So profit just refers to what you make as an owner, right? Wages refer to what you make as an employee, what you make in exchange for spending your skills and time. Whereas profit is just kind of passive income. It, it's what you make just, just by owning. So monopoly it's different. So you don't need to understand all the complexities of the monopoly, but the main difference is that if you're a monopoly, you're the only supplier of a particular good, and so you can just basically charge whatever you whatever price you want. And so naturally, you charge a price way above what people would ordinarily pay if it was perfect competition. And also, you, in order to achieve this, you supply less of what you would supply under perfect competition because you can you can do that. You can just supply less and no one else will come in to compete with you to pick up the slack. And so since there is less supply, then prices can be higher, but also less people will buy it, but that's fine. And th then you make profit in the difference. And so you want to be in the situation of the monopoly because that allows you to charge prices above what you would ordinarily be able to charge. And uh, you can just pocket the difference in, ter in terms of this passive income. You, you make profit, which is to say money as a, an owner. So according to microeconomic theory, eventually more and more people will enter the market until it gets closer to perfect competition. That's to say that, let's say that, that you're in a monopolistic, you're, you're in a monopoly industry or an oligopolistic industry, then what will happen is that more companies will enter the market, which they will increase the supply and when the supply increases, then the price will drop, and then eventually it will get closer and closer to perfect competition, and that will eat away at profits. And insofar as there are profits, that's temporary. More and more people will enter. Profits will decrease um, until they get to zero. On the other hand, if you're in a industry where there's negative profits, well, that too is unsustainable. What will happen is companies will go bankrupt, which is a very important necessary function for the functioning of the system. Companies will go bankrupt. And when that happens, then supply will drop, which means that prices will rise, which means that the existing companies that remain in the industry will be able to pick up, charge higher prices, and make, be able to start making less, less and less in the red, and they'll, they'll, it'll all resolve into zero profit. So zero profit is kind of like the equilibrium of a long enough time horizon. In, in practice, that doesn't always actually work. And the reason why is barriers to entry, which I'll discuss in a bit, barriers to entry prevent people from entering the market. And as well as that, there is what I'm going to call barriers to exit, which means essentially too big to fail. When a company is too big to fail, then basically the government doesn't allow it to fail. Like it's propped up, right? And every every government sector, like every every government agency necessarily, it's kind of like this. Like the, the government isn't just going to let what, one of their agencies fail. They're going to stop funding it, but they're not going to, you know, say, oh, you, you didn't meet your quotas, you're going to fail. I mean, they might, but the point is, um, but like another thing that I think is maybe too big to fail is like a university. Is the university really going to fail? No, they have giant endowments. They can do whatever they want. So in the real life, 
there are barriers to entry and barriers to exit that allow monopoly to propagate itself. And I'm a big proponent of measures to address this and kind of get rid of barriers to entry and stuff. But as long as they exist, you might as well play the game and use them to your advantage, right? Also, a big thing that matters in terms of measuring out what is a monopoly and what's not a monopoly, you have to get a definition of the industry. So example, if the industry is balls, then if you're a company that sells 100% of the baseballs, then you're not a monopoly because there are other companies that sell other balls. But if you measure the industry as the industry for baseballs, then you could be the monopoly. You sell all the balls. So a more practical example is some a lot of people like to define industry in terms of social media is an industry. I don't really like this. I like to think of specific applications of social media being industries. So in microeconomics, these aren't the only two models. There are also in-between states, oligopoly, monopolistic competition. You'll learn about those. You have to memorize those graphs probably. But what I'm going to argue and what, what Peter Thiel argues is that there, there aren't actually a lot. It's kind of, it's kind of fake. Like the, the companies that are not monopolies, they try to make themselves seem like monopolies in order to attract investors, that kind of thing. And companies that are monopolies, they try to make them seem like they're not monopolies so they don't attract antitrust. So it makes it appear like there's all these companies in between, halfway in between monopolies and perfect competition. In reality, it's much more stark. There are companies that operate on very thin margins, and then there are companies that have some sort of a competitive advantage, which allows them to be monopolies. The big theme of this section is pick a game you can win. And I'll get into what that means in a minute. But pick a game you can win. Don't... Peter Thiel, who I showed in the videos earlier, is very much against competition. He thinks competition is for losers. Like, competition competition can make you better at what you're competing at. But do you necessarily want to compete? That is that really the best thing for optimizing your profit? Well, the best thing for optimizing your profit is to actually pick something in which you don't have to compete. You don't even have to. You just become a monopoly. So the solution for this is to pick an industry where there are few enough people in the industry that you can dominate the industry, and then you can grow the industry of your own accord. So dominate a small industry, or pick a small game. And if there is no game that exists that you can dominate, well, just create one. So if you're someone creating a company, just create your own industry. Barriers to entry. These are things that allow you to maintain monopolies. There is proprietary technology. Proprietary technology may seem self-explanatory. One interesting distinction, though, is the difference between a difference in kind and a difference in amount. So a difference in amount is basically you scale something, you make it bigger, faster, more efficient, whatever. A difference in kind is it fundamentally does a different thing that you would not have been able to achieve with earlier technology. Going back to Peter Thiel, though, one thing that he said is that when you have a difference in amount, a difference in scale, which is 10x the previous version, then that difference is so great that it is at least as good as, or it comes back around to being essentially a, dif a difference in kind. Branding. Branding is interesting. So when you have a brand, what you're really selling people is that when, if someone buys something from that brand, they will receive the same product that they received many, many times than when they purchased that thing in from the brand before. The very first time they purchased something from the, from the brand, maybe they got it from a friend or something. Uh, people, maybe they experimented, who knows. But after they get it, they just like to get the same thing over and over. Because what you're really selling people there, what the brand, uh, what that offer is, is minimizing the prediction error. Which is to say, if you buy something where it's a brand you've never heard of, it could be something good, better than what you've had before, but it could be something a lot worse. And so, Insofar as people are, are risk averse, they might want to minimize the risk and just get something they know they like, which is probably going to be better than a lot of stuff that exists anyway. And so do they want to take the chance? No, it's kind of like natural selection, right? If you have offspring, how different should the offspring be? Like most mutations are not beneficial. Most, most mutations are hurtful, but a small number of mutations are good. So most times that you buy something that's a different brand than what you bought before, it's bad, but sometimes it will be good. <laughs> Another thing is copyright protections. This is essentially saying tell, telling the government to protect your monopoly, which we might want in certain situations. Like, not all monopolies are necessarily bad. We might want to reward people for inventing proprietary technologies, say. 
network effects. This is something I could talk about for an hour. But network effects are essentially the fact that you already have existing customers is itself a benefit for the, the thing that you're selling. So a good example is social media, right? With social media, if there's no one else using your social media pro pro product, it's not very useful. Like Facebook is useful because your friends are on Facebook. And the key thing here is user-generated content. So if you have some sort of website with user-generated content, then the having the users there, that is actually the asset that you're kind of selling people is people go there for the user-generated content. So being a market, right? A market for ideas, a market for a literal market, that's a network effect. Next, control of zero-sum resources. So let's say you own, own a gold mine, right? If you own a gold mine, then you're the only person who owns that gold mine. You know, no one else can mine from the gold mine. So it's kind of a zero-sum resource because you you bought something which came from the earth and there's only one of. Actually, there's many gold mines, but you can monopolize that too. You can just buy all the gold mines, right? It's a barrier to entry because you can't just build the gold mine. You have to find it or buy it. The next one is complex coordination slash economies of scale. I won't go into a lot of details about this one. And the next one is regulatory capture. And I will go into a lot of details about this later. A big distinction is the distinction between what is designed and what is evolved. However, I tend to anthropomorphize evolution. I tend to talk about evolution like evolution wants this and evolution wants that. And every time you do that, there are a lot of people who want to seem really smart and say, well, evolution doesn't want anything. Evolution doesn't care. Evolution isn't a thinking thing. It just does what it does and it, it doesn't have any plan in mind. Like I don't know that, right? Obviously, evolution is it's kind of this random, it uses randomness. It's a process that doesn't plan in advance. It doesn't think, oh, I want to evolve into a squid. It, it doesn't think like that. It just kind of tries a bunch of random things. And then it, it's the stuff that works, it works. And good, that, that stuff that works, it can reproduce itself even more. Uh, the point is, you can't help but anthropomorphize, ev anthropomorphize evolution a little bit because it, it behaves as though it wants to go towards a particular goal. It, it, it behaves in such a way where um, it's almost as if, if you look at a creature, it almost looks designed because it has all of these body parts, which all have these functions, and the, the creatures evolve to be adapted to their environment, and they're adaptive enough to reproduce. And when you look at a creature, you can, you can deduce without knowing much about it. You just know by virtue of the fact that it exists. Oh, it must have adapted to its environment. So it look, you look at it. And you can think about evolution as like the process that brought it about, and you can think of it almost like it wanted the creature to have traits that would allow it to survive, even though evolution didn't want anything. It's just it's just a semantic thing, right? There is a difference though, and they're not they're not identical. So I've been conflating them to, to say that they're more similar than people make out. But obviously, there's a difference between what's designed and what's evolved. To be designed, you have a designer that might have thought with their mind in a top-down way. I want to make some sort of creation that does this and this and this. And they think in sort of a first principles way. Okay, I need to have two wheels. And then I need to have a steering wheel. And then I need to have pedals. And then I need to have a place to sit. So they think in first principles kind of top-down way. Whereas a hand or something evolved, it doesn't think like that at all. It's just thinking trial and error, make slight modifications, see if that works, make slight modifications, see if that works. Here are two examples of roaming, right? A school of fish. The way a school of fish works is that all the fish want to stay next to all the other fish, but the school doesn't stay in one place. Um, they want to stay together, but also the, the school moves around a bit. People call this flocking. This is flocking behavior. So birds have flocking behavior. Fish, I think, are a better example of flocking behavior, even though the term doesn't make as much sense. It's, it's, a, it's a school of fish, not, not a flock, but even so. People who model chaotic systems, they talk about it. Uh, with the term flocking behavior to model how a lot of different kind of different cells in the system they can all coordinate. Another example is a herd of buffalo. So most buffalo stay within the herd. They stay surrounded by other buffalo. But then there are buffalo on the edges. There are buffalo on the very right of the herd. There are buffalo on the very left of the herd. And they might decide to wander off a little bit and then be followed by other buffalo who are not followed. And then there are buffalo on the front of the herd. And they might decide to drift a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left and then be followed or not followed. But there's a cascading effect where one buffalo might make a decision to go a particular direction or kind of drift in one particular direction. And then other buffalo 
immediately surrounding it, they might follow that buffalo or vaguely kind of go in the same direction. And then other buffalo might follow the buffalo surrounding that buffalo. And so there's a cascading effect whereby eventually all of the herd decide to, to drift either to the left or to the right. But it's a small effect on each instance. So never can you say, oh, that single buffalo, they're the, they're the, they're the leader. They led the herd. They decided to take the herd left or take the herd right. It's kind of a hive mind of the, all the buffalo together deciding to go based on a little bit of randomness and a little bit of the averageness of what each particular buffalo decided to do. And that's a swarming behavior. So we can think of this in terms of human organizations that exhibit swarming behaviors versus that are led more from the top down, where one leader directly controls his subordinates and then they directly control their subordinates. So one leader has like a unifying vision. I want to go exactly there and I'm going to take the organization exactly there. If we compare small organizations, there's a big, big difference between that and large organizations. Small organizations, they're a little easier to lead, I would say, a little easier to set a unifying direction. Because let's say it's just you, you know exactly what you're going to do because you thought about it you know, with your brain. And so it, it's less of a coordination problem, problem to lead it. So a big organization, it fun functions a little more like a herd. So maybe this is why in small organizations, sometimes uh, people can take more experiments. In the case of a small organization, let's say it has a particularly dominant leader, it can decide to set a course that is really risk-seeking. They say, I'm going to take the organization there, and I don't have anything to lose because I'm a small organization, and I'm, I'm seeking risk because I, I'm small already, so I don't have as much to lose. And if there are dozens and dozens of small organizations, then they all think, okay, one of us has to take over and become the new big organization. And, but only one of us is going to do it, so one of us has to take risks, and so there's more of an incentive to take risks. And they can do that because of uh, the agileness, the agileness of being smaller. So that's going to be a bit of advice. It's, when possible, try to plan more so than roaming. Because in terms of roaming, you should think that it's already over-competed. Roaming can work, but if you think about it, if you're a newcomer, if you roam, why should you have an advantage over the people who have been in the industry forever, the big organizations? There's undoubtedly going to be a bigger organization than you. So if you're trying to become the new big industry leader, then don't think that you can just win. Don't, don't think you can just take over all the others. And hey, even if you're the same size as all of the others, and even if there's no big organization, but you're just competing against dozens and dozens of smaller companies all the same size as you. Well, you still want to take risks because if you think of markets where the potential upside is very great, it's going to attract a lot of people trying to get in, trying to get their profit, get big, and you want to outcompete all of those other people. And so do you think that you're going to just happen to run into the, the right spot just by roaming around? Probably someone else is going to think of a strategy to get to the top spot before you. So you have to make very deliberate decisions and take on a kind of risk-seeking strategy in order to get to the top. Another point is that based on how I define planned, I don't think that a lot of decisions were actually truly planned. A lot of decisions by big corporations, that is. They had the appearance of being planned because at some stage in the process, some decision maker signed off. However, more often than not, those decisions weren't really a choice. They were kind of forced into it because it was the obviously right decision in the instance you didn't really have any other choices or because that was just the way the world was going and you had to go that way to keep up with the world whether you liked it or not. Either that or the, the choice could be attributed to causes outside of your control. Another difference between planning and roaming is that with roaming, you can only move in small jumps. But if you plan, you can move in a big jump all at once. You can make rapid changes, not just incremental changes of like kind of slowly drifting over here, or slowly drifting over there. I'll describe in a minute why I think rapid changes may be better. You want to plan and you want to build that unifying vision. It allows you to make rapid changes instead of just relying on incrementalism. So here's back with the adaptive valley. We've seen it before. So this, I think, will help explain why it's better to make rapid changes, right? You need to jump the valley. So let's say that everyone has already found a specific local optimum, a local peak on the valley. Everyone is competing over one specific thing. Everyone kind of knows to, do, to go there because it's already been exploited and that's how the big players are already making their money. That's the current situation. You are where everyone else is. So you don't want to stay there because 
The situation is just too competitive. You could have hundreds or thousands of people competing over all the same slice, the same spot, depending on how big the slice is. So you want a big new venture that takes on a, a different kind of cake, per se, that other people are not competing over. And you, you don't want all the profits to be competed away. So in order to gain your monopoly, you have to get to a result that is better than anyone else and occupy a space that no one else is occupying. And what has all these properties? Well, if everyone is competing over the first peak, you want to get to the peak too, the second peak, right? And no one is occupying it. So that requires you to cross the adaptive valley. The implications of this are you have to get worse before you get better. So a lot of people don't want to do that. And furthermore, people who roam, as in organizations that roam, they're not really capable of crossing the valley. You'll be unlikely to miss peak two unless you make a coordinated effort to aim for it. Um, and now in theory, it's it's possible to get to peak two by accident. However, it's harder than this simplified graph would seem to make it seem because this makes it seem like, oh, you can just kind of jump to the right and wow, you're at another peak. You're at peak two. How hard can it be? Well, remember that in reality, it's not just a a two-dimensional graph. It's like a 50-dimensional graph where the trait, what I'm calling the, the x-axis, right, that could be like 49 different dimensions. And so it's a complex coordination problem to get to peak two. And so to see it, you have to really reason about it and, and see it in your mind and kind of think through where the next peak can be. A lot of these peaks, they're called irreducibly complex, which is like a term that um, creationists like to say like oh something is irreducibly complex which means there's no way you could have gotten to it just by natural selection i disagree with that however it is helpful to be an actual planner an actual creator who can think through it in advance and know that they can go there without actually having to put at risk all those all those trial and error experiments that will most of them will inevitably fail so this is an incremental change obviously it just slide gr gradually from one place on the peak to another place on the peak and you're going to get worse in the process. This of course is what you want. You want to be able to broach uncharted treasure to find some new opportunity. So the way that politics works in Washington DC, it's very roamy. It's very, let's kind of slowly build more and more laws on top of the existing laws and j that just make everything more complex and like maybe add more and more federal programs and add more and more federal agencies and more and more of these tax breaks or whatever, more and more subsidies, more and more, you know, so social welfare programs or whatever. There's not a lot of thought about elimination. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but I'm biased in favor of thinking in terms of elimination because I like to think, okay, what if we could just wipe the slate clean and like start this over from scratch? Like if you look at a lot of old and decrepit systems, a lot of it just seems t totally inefficient and like, oh, if I could just design this from scratch, it would work way better. Or not me, someone who has a good, good amount of knowledge of these systems. The way it works now is obviously inefficient. And if we could just tear it all down and start it from scratch, it would be way better. This is actually how I first got interested in politics is like through thought experiments of, okay, what if I could create a city that was like the perfect city and just have everything built up from scratch? I think a lot of people, you know, when they're kids, they think about like Sim City, that type of thing, that, that way of thinking about politics. Or what if you could develop a country from scratch? Like what would be all of the laws of your new country? A lot of people, that's an interesting thought experiment, right? But uh, and some examples of thinking in terms of rapid changes instead of incrementalism is like social security. People talk about, you know, should we slightly increase or decrease social security? But ultimately it's kind of a Ponzi scheme system where you rely on the young people to fund the program to take care of the old people. It's just a, it's not really, you put, put your money in the, in the government and they give it back to you. Really it's just a transfer program from the young to the old. And at some point there's going to be more old people than young people, unless you have a stellar birth rate. And in, in, in that case, if, if there's not enough young people, then you have to take in lots of immigrants. Well, you don't have to, but like that's going to be an argument for taking in a lot of immigrants who are going to be disproportionately young to pay for the social security, right? And you just think, oh, this is so inefficient. What if you could do it over from scratch and just kind of replace social security with another system? And, and just completely, instead of talking about like 10% increases to immigration or 10% decreases to immigration, I would prefer people to think about what if we could eliminate immigration except for certain types, or like I, this is not something I support, but um, there are some people who argue, well, let's, uh, let's rapidly increase immigration, 10x what it is right now, right? 
I think Matt Iglesias is talking about this. Unfortunately, it seems a lot more likely than my idea of, of radically reshaping immigration how I want to. But I, although I very much disagree with like Matt Iglesias, like let's have a 1 billion Americans, at least I kind of respect how it's a rapid change. You know, it's a dramatic thing. It's not incrementalist, right? So it's just stupid, but at least I kind of respect it. Another thing is like Andrew Yang proposing universal basic income. Now, I think that universal basic income is a really stupid idea. The way that Andrew Yang proposed to implement it was also a stupid implementation. But when I think about universal basic income, at least when Andrew Yang proposed it, he proposed, well, it's going to sort of be a replacement for existing welfare because in order to get the UBI, you have to forfeit of the existing welfare programs. And progressives talked about this like it was a bad thing, which is totally mind-blowing to me. Like, why wouldn't you want to get rid of the old inefficient systems that existed before and replace it with a single efficient system? Like, that would seem like the exact thing you want, despite the fact that I don't even agree with either, but it's just mind-blowing that people would talk like it's a bad thing, that it replaces the old thing. It should replace the old thing. That's the whole point, right? So another example of rapid changes is we have a tax program where we have these tax rates, which might be high, might be low, they used to be high or whatever. And then um, we have a bunch of tax credits and tax deductions and ways to get out of taxes. And we have thousands of them to the point where, like if you're a corporation, you have to hire fancy lawyers to get you out of as many taxes as possible. And even individuals, if they have high net worth, they might hire fancy lawyers to get them out of taxes. And that's super inefficient, right? We should restructure taxes so that it's, Maybe there's like three tax deductions, but everything else, you just pay your taxes and that's it. So something that's a piece of advice that a lot of people will give you about how to do planning more efficiently is thinking from first principles. Because then you can actually arrive at conclusions that you couldn't just get by kind of randomly trying things out. If you think from first principles, you might end up at a radically different spot than you are now. But it could be correct because you can verify it objectively using the fact that you basically deduced it from first principles, right? First principles, you've heard all this before. Now, in practice, I think that a lot of people who advocate for first, first principles, they might like, think it's a neat concept, but they don't really like it in practice. Like, I used to work for a bank where I had a boss who kind of gave explanation. She didn't call it first principles, but she called it like, we should say why, why, why like a baby, just to get to the fundamental reasons that we're doing things. And she gave a bunch of thought experiments where you would have to utilize the first principles in that thought experiment. But when I got down to it and I tried to utilize first principles, I just ended up sounding like an idiot. I asked her, why, why, why? And she was like, why don't you know this? You're an idiot. So that, that's the lesson. When If you work in a bank, don't actually try to get at first principles because they like to support stuff like that. But really, it's all corporate politics and stuff. Because in reality, to, the way to use first principles, it's enough to just say use first principles. Anyone can say that. But the way to do that is to ask questions that seem crazy to everyone else. So if you ask crazy questions, that's like, how do you achieve your 10-month plan in six months? Or how do you 10x your output? So I got those questions from Peter Thiel. And what makes it different is that you shouldn't take no for an answer. Like if, if you ask someone, how do you achieve your 10 year plan in the next six months? A lot of people will say, oh, it's just impossible. But you should not, you should not take that. You should say, well, it's just tell me how to do it. Tell, or you're fired, right? If you're, if you're the boss, you need to make people think about this kind of stuff. You, you, can't, you can't accept that something is impossible because you don't really know what's impossible until you really think about it. So one thing that you want is this concept that I think originated from Scott Adams, actually, which is the concept of the skill stack. If you have one skill, then what are the chances that you're, that you're going to be the best person in the world at that skill? Because remember, that what is that is what you need. In order to capture the winner-take-all effects, you should probably be the best person in the world. Okay, let's say, say there's a million people doing the particular thing. Well, you would need to be in the top 0 0.00, you know, 1 in a million to be the best in the world. But let's say you have a skill stack, okay? You have five skills, each of which are unusual enough, like each of which you're in the top 1%. Then, assuming they're independent, the first one, you're in the top 1%, and then the next skill, you're in the top 1% of that, and then you're in the next skill. So if you multiply across 1% times 1% times 1% times 1%, it comes out to a very, very, very small number. 
And so of that set of five skills that you have particularly curated, it is very possible that you may be just the best person in the world at that very particular set of five skills, right? So Scott Adams, self-aggrandizingly, when he invented this concept, he used it as an example himself. He said, I'm not the funniest guy, I'm not the best drawer, I'm not the best office worker, I'm not the most dependable person, but I can produce cartoons because I'm above average in all of those five. I don't want to, I don't know if I want to say that, how accurate that is about Scott Adams, but what you do want is you want to combine a set of skills that are infrequently combined because um, when we multiply the skills across each other, skill A, skill B, skill C, well, if the skills are highly correlated, then chances are there's a lot of people who have that set of skills. But if they're uncorrelated, if they're infrequently combined, that, that's better, right? You want, you want as low correlation as possible. So doesn't this contradict the idea I had about special, specialization? Well, not necessarily. So the reason why this actually doesn't contradict the idea of specialization is the distinction between a skill and a game. The game is the thing you want to specialize in. The skills are things that you want to combine in order to become good at the game. So a, a skill is basically some activity, competitive typically, you're trying to win something or get something, and um, it's made up of skills, which is to say in order to succeed at that game, you have to succeed at skills. So the skills are subcomponents, sub-abilities. So with almost any game, you can subdivide it into skills that you need for that game. For example, football requires running, throwing, catching, uh, standardized tests. They require memorization, improvisation, critical thinking, diligent study, conceptual understanding. Animation requires storytelling, sound design, world building. Theoretically, you could recursively deconstruct those. So for each skill, you could conceptualize it as a game and think of the skills that went into that skill. But it's useful when you're practicing a game to try to deconstruct the individual skills into the highest level of granularity as possible because that allows you to isolate those individual skills and practice them just over and over and over and over and that way you can look at your reps and see which reps are good which reps are bad and in that way you can get better like if you're, if you're trying to get better at football you can practice running in a hundred different times a hundred different over and over and over and over again and you can practice throwing a bunch of different ways over and over and over and over again and catching over and over so you want to isolate these skills to know when you're getting better at them and when, and when you're not so the key insight here is that more unusual games are easier to win because there are fewer people qualified for them so when you form a skill stack you essentially want to combine a set of skills that basically when combined form a particular activity, which is to say a game, because game is a general term here. You want to form a game which no one else is good at, and it might not even be a popular game. That doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be football. It can be a game that literally no one has played yet. That's the key thing. Let's say you create a business, right? If you're competing in a space that other people have competed in, then you're a latecomer to the industry, you might have to work extra hard to get ahead, but what you really want is to create a company where you're essentially forming an industry that didn't exist before. Or maybe industry is too broad of a term, but forming a certain market space that didn't exist before, and you want to carve that out. And so to say, oh, just create a whole new game that you can dominate, to someone who thinks in terms of sports, or thinks in terms of competition, that just doesn't make any sense. Who cares if you're the best at the game? But if you think in terms of business, then that's exactly what you want. You want to be able to dominate a particular space. More examples of skills. Um, skill, typically I'm thinking in terms of raw, physical, single motions, like maybe sprinting, maybe um, strength training, uh, you know, like the, the bench press or something like that. Games, you can think of in terms of like an election, uh, getting a job. It's really hard to be singularly good at one particular task. So what are the chances you're ever going to be the best sprinter in the world? Very, very slim, right? But what are the best you're ever going to be at your specific job? Like you're very unusual. Let's, let's say you have a very unusual job. Well, you could be the best in the world at that. And that's useful because if you have skills that no one else has, then people covet that. People covet that specialization. That's what you want to do. You want to create a game, which is to say an industry or a field where your business can exist, where you can dominate or win. You don't even have to think in terms of creating a business. Just create some sort of arena where you can dominate and get those exponentially high returns. So 
pick one obscure enough and be the best in the world at it. Or you could even be the best in the world at a very popular thing and that's a way to go. It's just much, much less likely. It's much less likely that you're going to be the rest, rest, best restaurant in New York or something like that. So what you want to do is, between specialization and being a generalist, well, you could combine it. You could basically pick three or four or five skills that you really want to dominate and specialize in those and combine them. So this might seem all like the blandest advice, the most platitudes ever. So leverage your strength. It's the most platitude ever. Have a vision. Do the impossible. Be yourself. Oh, I don't even want to say it. Yeah, I get it. This is this is the most um, platitudinous advice ever. But what you want is to uh, achieve a monopoly. And basically, there are insights in these platitudes that you can leverage.